Hi, this is Pastor Bob. Today we're going to talk about a sinner that came and gave his life to the Lord, Naaman the leper. Came with skepticism, came with all types of problems, unbelief, but finally accepted the Lord as the Savior after receiving divine healing. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hi, I'm Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome again to Student of the Word. Glad to have you here today. You know, there's a scripture in the uh, New Testament telling us the purpose of the Old Testament. And I honestly, I guess, I just get concerned sometimes when, uh, you know, new uh, Christians and, and often those who even go to Bible school say, well, you know, we just, we think the Old Testament's over. God fulfilled the Old Testament. No, he fulfilled the law. The Old Testament it was filled. Listen, the Old Testament has so many times before the law and even during the law, they were saved by simple faith. The law was never designed for salvation. The law was designed to teach us about Jesus Christ. Paul said the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, but once we came to Christ, we're no longer the schoolmaster. So the point is, that then what's the purpose of the Old Testament? In fact, I've talked to many Christians that have been Christians for some time, said, I don't understand the Old Testament. There's hardly any doctrine there. It's just people, 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 and most of it's people's failures. I mean, yes, it's got some great things about David, but how many times is David's sins brought up? Abraham's sins brought up. Twice he tried to give his wife away. And then David's son, Solomon. I mean, you think David sinned bad. Solomon even sinned worse. But yet David was called a man after God's own heart. And then Solomon, Jesus said, was the second wisest man that ever existed. Yet how'd they get into all these messes? I simply come back to this. The Old Testament is where we get our examples for life. And they are so astronomical, so huge, so out of bounds. It literally comes to this. If God could take care of a man during a flood that took over the entire world and killed everybody, but he and his family, I guess he can take care of me. If God could split a Red Sea, when's the last time you need an entire ocean split in front of you to save you? You never have, never will. But if God could do that for Moses and two million Jews, he can certainly take care of your problem. I mean, when's the last time you got swallowed by a whale? Come on, tell me when. You haven't and never will be swallowed by a whale. The point comes back to this. If God could take care of uh, Jonah back there, he can take care of you. The point is, that's why the Bible is filled with all these stories. And we find in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, the necessity of having the Old Testament. Why we're even told again in Timothy that the word of God was given to us and that all scripture, all scripture, that's not just the New Testament, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable. You just have to find out why the Old Testament is profitable in its way and the New Testament is profitable in its way. It's for our admonition and our teaching. Romans 15, 4. Whatever things were written before, that's the Old Testament, were written for our learning. So the Old Testament is there for our learning too, and not just to be thrown away as, oh, God fulfilled it, it's all out of the way. There's many things that have been fulfilled, such as Jesus going to the cross, dying, buried, resurrected, seated in heaven. That's been fulfilled, but we certainly don't put that out of the way. It's still our means of salvation. There's things yet to be fulfilled, even in the Old Testament. There's things that are written that are yet to be fulfilled, lining up with the book of Revelation. And the point of it was, if God is taking care of all these other things, then God's going to even go back and fulfill those things too. So again, Romans 15, 4, whatever things were written before, that's the Old Testament, were written for our learning. 1 Corinthians 10, a great chapter on telling you what the Old Testament was all about. It was written for our admonition, for our examples. Look at verse 11. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, all these things happened to them, Old Testament saints, as examples and were written written for our admonition. So all of them were written for examples. Listen to this. All things were written to them as examples, not examples to them. Those things happened as examples for us. All things that happened in the Old Testament, God specifically had them to help explain New Testament doctrines. In other words, if they were written for our admonition as a minister, 
I learned a long time ago, the Old Testament was the greatest place to find stories for my sermons. I would often throw in examples about myself and that's fine. Jesus did and Paul did, but listen, most of the things that Jesus pointed to and Paul and Peter were Old Testament stories. And the thing of it is, is that's why there's so many varied stories. And listen, 90% of the stories are what happened to believers and mainly carnal believers. So listen, if there's hope back there for Abraham, if there's hope back there for Moses and Noah, if there was hope back there for Samson, good Lord, then there's certainly hope for you today. And so what God is simply saying was, if God could take care of them, he certainly will take care of you. So again, as a minister, I learned a long time ago when I would teach, I would take New Testament doctrine and bring in an Old Testament example of a person and that story they had helped amplify what we find in the New Testament. New Testament doctrines can be clearly seen in Old Testament stories. Again, like I said, personal stories are fine, but even the best of stories from the word, let the Bible prove itself. The Bible can prove itself. It doesn't need your life to prove it. Doesn't need your examples to prove it. Although that's fine, it adds credibility, but to prove itself, all the Bible does is compare itself to itself. It stands unique. Jesus used many stories from the Old Testament to tell of redemption and his coming as Messiah. We're gonna take a look at Naaman. Naaman the leper is the one I want to talk about today. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. Yesterday we talked about Lot. And we talked about in Lot's life how that again, Lot was an example of an Old Testament believer who was carnal. Naaman was an unbeliever, came to know the Lord, still had problems, but again, how he snapped out of it. We don't know what happened to Naaman, but I would tell you this probably, Naaman became a much better believer than was Lot himself. Lot lived in carnality. Again, a believer, went to paradise when he died, but man, what a miserable guy on earth. And the most miserable people on earth are not sinners. They are Christians who are carnal out of fellowship with God. In fact, the first thing that 1 John tells us in chapter one about coming back into fellowship is that these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Man, carnal Christians have no joy. And we find that with Lot. But let's talk about Naaman today. And uh, this story that I'm giving to you came through the life of Elisha. That's exactly what we're offering for the offer on this broadcast. Second Kings chapter five and verse one. This is again, when Elijah had already gone to be with the Lord and Elisha was on this earth. It says, now Naaman, commander of the armies of the king of Syria was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor but a leper. Whoa, did you catch that? All the great things that were said about him, but a leper. Leprosy in the word of God, and especially in the Old Testament, is a type of sin. And a leper is a type of an unbeliever. Listen to this, all the things that was written about him. He was a commander in chief of the king's army. That's the highest position in the leadership in his profession. His dedication to his profession told of his love for his country and the people of the nation. Next of all, number two, he was great man with his master. The king of Syria was strongly devoted, committed to Naaman and his military leadership. Naaman was completely trusted. It took years of devotion and a track record of integrity, but the king of Syria totally trusted in him. To receive a command from Naaman was to receive a command from the king. So secondly, again, he was a great man, a great master. Number three, he was honorable. Even though he was not a believer, he was true to himself. His word was his bond. A handshake from Naaman was all that was needed. Naaman was high in royal favor because he was trustworthy, not only in the field of battle, but in private business, in his family, in his integrity, and with the people of Syria and with the king. By him, verse four says, the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. He had unknowingly been used by God to win battles. And because that God was going to approach him and he's gonna receive the Lord as his savior, he had unknowingly been used by God to win battles. His heart was open to know the truth and God was preparing him to become a believer in the Lord. Naaman had a divine destiny. Fifthly, he was called a man of valor. He was skilled in military tactics. He was also brave. He was daring. He was fearless. He put his own life on the line many times in defense of his country and of his fellow soldiers. He had many awards and medals proving his bravery. Now listen to this, all this again comes back to the fact God was working on him, but he still was not a believer yet. 
And we've seen this in the world. How often, you know, in my own church, I saw this happen, is that someone would come to church and, you know, they may not come down and receive Jesus, but it was the mayor or it was an assistant to the mayor. Or it might have been some, you know, someone from Washington and uh, they were a congressman, senator. We weren't sure if they were born again, but they visited our church. And man, people immediately said, oh, he must be a Christian. He came to our church. No, because a person comes to church doesn't mean he's a Christian. Yeah, but such an honorable person. There are honorable believers and there are honorable unbelievers. In fact, to be honest with you, some unbelievers are more honorable than are some believers. And that's often sad. So you can quote all the great things about them. I mean, we've had presidents in there. We talk about some of our best presidents and it comes down to it. Well, they must be because of what they said about God. Well, unbelievers can talk about God. I remember under Ronald Reagan, we had the year of the Bible and I'm sure the Bible must have affected him greatly. I'm still not quite sure if Ronald Reagan was a Christian. I'd like to see him in heaven. That'd be wonderful. He had all the the outward displays, except he didn't talk about Jesus much or anything like that, but he had all these moral attributes about him. But it still comes back to this, whether he was saved or not, comes back to this, is that there are moral sinners out there. In fact, some sinners can act better than some Christians do. In fact, maybe you work with some of these people. And the first thought you think of is, well, surely when they die, they're going to heaven. This man was honorable toward his wife and his children and all that. None of that will save you. Everything we've talked about him, this guy was a man of valor. Naaman also, again, was given deliverance. He was right under the king. The king trusted him. The people trusted him. All those things. But here's the point. It finally says, but he was a leper. That's exactly what's wrong with the world. You can name all the wonderful things about them, but the final thing comes back to it. As leprosy was a type of sin and a leper a type of a sinner, we simply come back to this. In all the things we talked about, he was an unbeliever. He had leprosy. Imagine all the wonderful, how many wonderful people do we see on television, on the news that were military heroes and wonderful actors. And we loved the films they made. They were family type films or else they were just films about love and wonderful moral principles that came through them. But we come to the bottom line and they died. Were they a Christian? I don't know. I can simply tell you all those wonderful attributes did not send them to heaven. All the wonderful attributes about him simply came back to this. He was a leper. And how often do people die young in life and they what? They died of cancer. They died of a heart attack. We go, oh man, they were so young. And we, we think, well, maybe all their goodness sent them to heaven. No, if goodness will send you to heaven, why did Jesus have to come to the cross and die? And when we find out he was a leper, there was one thing missing, an encounter with Jesus Christ himself. Though God had been preparing him, God had to be looking down the pike of time and saw that there was gonna come a time when he would be confronted with the gospel and receive it. So God began to work with him to shape and mold his life toward that time when he came. And then his free will could come out and accept the Lord as Savior. He was a leper. This cast a shadow over everything, all the wonderful attributes, all the wonderful accomplishments that he had in his life and his career. Nothing else mattered as he was facing death, although everyone thought highly of him. They could not save him from this incurable disease. No matter what other people think about you, they can't save you. Only one person can. His name is Jesus Christ, and he can bring deliverance. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about leprosy as a type of sin, the fallen condition all of us are in without Jesus Christ. You're about to be blessed. Hang on. Elisha the prophet is an intriguing figure of the Old Testament, a miracle worker that deserves the extensive study that this series provides through these 13 lessons, which include the call of the miracle worker, where to begin a miracle ministry, the greatest miracle of all, water in the desert, oil in abundance, our heart's desire, faith to raise the dead, Naaman, his pride and his miracle, the purpose of a miracle, returning what is lost, open and shut case, unseen deliverance, and does God remember our faithfulness? To order The Life of Elisha, visit our website at bobyendian.com. Hi, Pastor Bob here. It's time for my annual minister's conference. It's going to be March the 7th through the 9th in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'll be speaking. Joseph Z will be joining me as well as Orlando Juarez teaching on praise and worship. I look forward to it. Every year has been a life-changing event for me and for the ministers who attend. And I believe in, in the year 2024, we're going to see a special move of God like never before. So I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible that are involved in any section of ministry at all. Thanks. Have a great day. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. 
Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Leprosy is a type of sin, a type of our fallen condition. In fact, it's interesting in the Bible, leprosy, which is curable today, but it was the incurable thing back then. It's kind of like the AIDS of today or things we find that we cannot find a cure for these things. But leprosy was back then totally incurable and was seen as incurable. And that's why it became a type of sin. And so all disease in the Old Testament, found in the Old Testament, is connected to rebellion toward God and is connected toward uh, the evidence of sin in the Levitical law. Let me say that again. All disease is both the fruit and the evidence of sin in the Levitical law. The leper didn't see a physician. The leper, even to discover his leprosy, he went to the high priest. Once that he was actually healed, if he was healed, and we don't find any evidence of anyone ever being healed in the Old Testament of leprosy, the first one we find in the Bible was the leper that came to Jesus and he was healed completely. And Jesus didn't say, go show yourself to a, a physician. He said, go show yourself to the priest. This is what it was. Because leprosy was a type of sin. They didn't see a physician. When it was first discovered, they stood before the priest. When if it ever was healed, they stood again before the uh, priest in the uh, Le- under the Levitical law. So all disease, is both the fruit and the evidence of sin in the Levitical law. The leper again didn't see a physician. He went to the high priest in dealing with the disease and if he ever got remedied from it, healed. There was no prescription remedy. Only a miracle could cure a leper. There's nothing man-made. All prescriptions are man-made, even though the things that we make uh, prescription medicine from comes from nature. Nature cannot heal you. Only the God of nature can truly set you free from sickness and disease. So there's no prescription remedy. Only a miracle can cure a leper. The leper was cut off from the dwelling place of God and the people. He was placed outside the camp. This is where we get the expression that a sinner is outside the camp. The camp is for believers. We are the ones that are born again. We're inside the camp, but Jesus was crucified outside the camp. What a wonderful thing. We're told to go outside the camp for witnessing. Why? Because that's where the world is. It's like the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a separate place, a place like Goshen in the Old Testament in the land of Egypt where the where the Israelites were, and it was protected from all of those things that were happening throughout Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. Egypt is a type of unbelief in this world. You get born again, you can come into the family of God, of which Israel was a type of back there, of which the church is today. And so Jesus was crucified outside the camp. We are to go outside the camp to witness. This is the dwelling place of the leper. They had to live out there. In, In other words, in those incurable diseases, they took the ones that had it and separated from those who did not have it. Let's take a look at the disease itself. Leprosy was it had an insignificant beginning. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 13 and verse two, it told, here's how it begins. It begins by a little rising on the skin, then a scab, and then a bright red spot would appear after that. So there was these phases to where you could tell you saw a rising on the skin, uh-oh, don't want that, and then a scab for, uh-oh, no, no, no. When the bright spot appeared, that, that red spot that was there, suddenly you know you had leprosy. And the moment that was seen, the moment that first indicator was there, you were banished outside the camp. Leprosy, literally, it was a communicable disease, but leprosy was also inherited. Inherited, a communicable disease, poisoning of the blood, and so it readily is transmitted from parent to child. So it is with the curse of Adam. Sin passed on to all men, Psalm 51 and verse 5, and Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. So the point of it is man is born in sin. 
And yes, sin itself in the natural life by living in sin can come because we live around it so much that our that literally our will gets taken in by it. And sinners are first of all sinners because they were born into sin, but secondly, they commit sin also because they have the nature, but also because of the community around them. So much sin and they begin to excuse everything they do. That's why we as a born again believer start on the inside with God's righteousness and then it manifests to the outside where in the midst of the worst situations, in the midst of the pressures of the world, we can live for the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, point number one is leprosy had an insignificant beginning, but leprosy is inherited plus it's a communicable disease if it can be brought from one to another. Leprosy is a type of sin. You are a sinner by birth, but you often commit sin by what goes on around you. It's possible for a sinner, again, to live a life before others that is moral and despite what's going on in the world to swim upstream in that respect. But again, you have gotta deal with the leprosy on the inside. That, that's the very cause of sin. And that leprosy, that sin on the inside of you came from the fallen seed of Adam and we're born into this earth in sin, and that has to be can only taken away one way. No man-made thing can do it. No religion can take care of it. The only way is to come to Jesus Christ, and in Adam all die, but in Jesus Christ all will be made alive. There's a day you said no to Satan, and yes to Jesus, and you were taken out of the world and placed into the church. You were taken out of Adam and into Jesus. You died to Adam and were reborn into the Lord Jesus Christ by a simple decision. I'm going to accept Jesus Christ as my savior and the absolute Lord of my life. So leprosy is inherited, a communicable disease, poisoning of the blood, and so it readily is transmitted from parent to child, as it is from person to person, as with the curse of Adam passed on to all men. Leprosy works almost imperceptibly. A little pain is attached to the disease and only toward the end of the disease is it the horribleness of it seen. It's like the deceitfulness of sin brought out in Hebrews chapter three and verse 13. Leprosy spreads quickly. Though it begins with certain spots under the skin, which are small at first, they gradually increase in size and finally affect the entire body. The corruption goes inward as well as outward, even to the bone marrow. In Romans chapter seven and verse 18 says this, I know that is in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Even though you're born again in your flesh, the nature that's still with you from the fall, that's inside your body, it's called the body of sin, it's called sin which works in my members, that will be with you as long as you're here on this earth, but the nature inside of you is greater. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So if we live for the Lord Jesus Christ, we decide to live from our spirit and to be spiritually minded is life and peace, but to be carnally minded is death. Everything we produce is going to die. And that's why again, Paul said in Romans 7 and verse 18, I know that is in me, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Leprosy is highly infectious. Those who saw a leper coming to them were to cry out unclean, enter not into the path of the wicked, nor go in the way of evil men, avoid it, pass by it, turn from it and pass away, Proverbs chapter four, verses four and five. Again, when you see sin coming, run from it. Oh, listen, love the sinner, but hate the sin. You know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, and yet on the other hand, it says, God said to hate the world. People often wonder that. It's because the word world has two different definitions. The world we are to hate is the world system, and that's under Satan himself. But we're supposed to love the people of the world. When Jesus tells us to hate the world, he also said in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. That's the people in the world that whoever, that's talking about the people, believe in him should not perish. I can go into the world hating the world system, but seek out people and deliver them out of that into the body of Christ. I'm simply here to tell you, you know, the church is like a, a ship pulling next to a ship that is sinking, the Titanic. Over here on this ship, they're going under. They may be having some string bands up there. They may be playing some things while they're going under, trying to make the, bad, the best of a bad situation. But the whole thing is, is these people on this ship are not going to make it. They're going down, they're part of the world. We're trying to get them to jump over onto this ship, which cannot be taken under, the church of which the gates of hell shall not prevail against. And so again, we are told to, for the world as far as they're concerned, that we are not to go into the way, we are to avoid what men are into, don't, don't even get into it, but pass by it, 
turn from it, and finally pass away from it altogether. The leper was hated by those in society. And uh, Job said this, all my friends abhor me and they of whom I love have turned against me, Job 19, 19. Leprosy is a state of living death. There's discoloration of the skin, loss of senses, spreading ulcers, the fingers, toes, nose drop off, vision is impaired, sometimes blindness results. The leper is a walking sepulcher. Leprosy was incurable as far as the Old Testament was concerned. No medicine could cure it, no doctor could treat it. It can only be remedied by a miracle from God. Hebrews 7, 25, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him. Jesus said to a leper, I will it be clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Matthew chapter eight and verse three. Although Jesus healed a physical disease, it's the physical disease that is the one great representative of diseases, speaking of sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. Let's talk about this cleansing miracle that happened. Naaman was guided by three people in his road to healing. These were not people of nobility or royalty, but common people in his home, in Israel, and on his staff. First, a young Jewish girl taken into the home as a servant told him of the miracle ministry of Elisha. She was taken captive as the, as, as his own armies came and, and captured these people. This young girl came over and she became a servant in his house. And so when she saw that he had and heard that he had leprosy, she had compassion on him. Even though he had taken her as a slave, she had compassion on him and said, oh, I wish you were back there in my home because there is a prophet named Elisha and he can heal this. Man, he needed to hear something because doctors couldn't help him, anything, but he heard about a prophet. Secondly, Elisha's servant came out of the house and told Naaman he was to dip in the Jordan River seven times. Here, a servant approached him as a girl that worked in his house. Next of all, when he got to Elisha's house, a servant came out of the house and told him how he was to get healed, dip in the Jordan River seven times. And when he got upset at that, his own servant that traveled with him convinced him that Elisha had not asked him to do something difficult, but asked him to do something that was only humbling. And Naaman did what the prophet had asked and came out of the water the seventh time, completely cleaned and healed of all the diseases. Why am I saying this? Why am I telling you a servant girl, a servant in Elisha's house and his own servant, Naaman's own servant helped him? It simply comes back to this. In every case, he was not helped by nobility. He was not helped by a king or whatever. He was helped by common people around him. Your cleansing, your help, your deliverance, your healing, don't turn down anybody that comes to you. I'm simply telling you, God can work through anybody. Look in the case of Saul of Tarsus, what happened to him? He was knocked down and God didn't send some notable minister. He didn't send John to him or, or Peter to him. He didn't send one of the disciples. No, he sent this common man who came to him who was an unknown and told him how he would receive his sight, how God had a call on him. And then he probably never saw him again after that. So what men could not do, the God of Israel did with Naaman. I expect to see a very grateful Naaman in heaven one day. He must have become a believer in the Lord that day, dedicated his life to convincing Syrians of the truth of redemption. What a great story we have. Be sure and get a copy of this life of Elisha so you can be blessed by hearing even more about Naaman. We'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.